Chapter 20, 20 Street Power Shift. Many weeks had passed since the confrontation between 20 Street's old dogs and new booties, and the split between the two factions seemed to be on the man. And the turmoil and unrest associated with conflicting leadership appeared to be behind them. In September 2007, 20th Street held its first truly cohesive meeting in a long time at Sutro Park, conducted under its new leader, Cycle. Tigre was also present at the meeting and seemingly in good standing with the gang. Perhaps accepting that he was aging out of the gang life, Tigre appeared to be resigning himself to a Cycle-led 20th Street. Cycle was an obvious choice for succession as leader. He had committed significant amount of dirt for La Mara over the years. He also had the backing of the big homies now, as well as the loyalty of the newer generation of thugs who represented the future of the clique. Cycle was a demanding taxter for the youngsters in the gang, and he took the grooming of new members seriously. He conducted regular orientation classes for new and prospective clique members at Bolincito's house on Vienna Street, where he regularly screened a video for use entitled Hijos de la Guerra, or Children of the War. It was a documentary about the history of MS-13 in El Salvador. Cycle made watching the film mandatory for all new recruits because, he said, it would enlighten them about the origins of the gang and the hardships experienced by the Salvadorian people. Reports of successful new attacks by 20th Street on the Norteños were circulating regularly back to Santini through Casper. The gang's menacing reputation in the criminal world and its stronghold in the mission districts were as firmly entrenched as ever. The 20th Street members were now regularly paying cash dues to the clique, and the big homies seemed content with the regular visits from MS-13 runners bearing tributes of cash, cell phones, and other merchandise to the Central American prisons, delivered with all due respects and compliments from 20th Street. Cycle was also ensuring all gangs in the neighborhood were paying a tax to the clique. He was collecting cash-filled envelopes from the Meseros, as well as the 11th Street and 19th Street Sureños, keeping 20th Street's coffers flush to purchase guns from Negro and Reno and another more local source, which Santini was unable to identify yet. Casper was relieved about the lessened strife and turmoil within 20th Street. Like Tigre, he was enjoying a less prominent role in the game, although lingering suspicion about his cooperation with law enforcement had not completely dissipated. In fact, one of the topics at the Sutro Park meeting of the newly harmonized 20th Street was a developing problem for Casper, stirred up by a gang member named Manuel Yumana, aka Lulu. The homie was spreading rumors that Casper was a snitch and couldn't be trusted. At the meeting, Casper openly objected to Lulu's potentially lethal accusations. Unfortunately for Lulu, Casper and some other veteran gang members already knew he had never been jumped in with MS-13. Armed with his damning knowledge, Casper went on the offensive and argued during the meeting that Lulu's claim of being a full-fledged MS member needed to be investigated. As the clique's new leader, Cycle took Casper's claim seriously because he was determined to improve the 20th Street's reputation for poor discipline with the big homies. He requested that senior gang members in El Salvador investigate whether Lulu was actually a jumped-in member. The gang's investigation into Lulu's history only confirmed that his brother, known inside MS-13 as Vago, was jumped in with the Amarguerguenos clique in Calle y la Amarguerga in El Salvador. I don't care if that was pronounced right, that's how you're gonna get it, that's how you got it, that's what it is. With no indication Lulu himself ever was, Psycho proclaimed he would be disciplined with a serious beating. After that, the gang would make a final determination on his fate. When results of the full investigation into Lulu's history came back from the big homies in El Salvador, Cycle and Peloncito learned Lulu was paying a bribe to a senior gang member in El Salvador named Gato to provide phony confirmation that he was jumped in. Lulu was greenlighted for death and Gato, a leader of the Marguenos, however you say that, Locals Clica in El Salvador was assassinated by order of the big homies. The threat to Casper from Lulu was eliminated now, but there were still others inside the gang that needed to be worried about, including Casper's duplicitous former girlfriend Jackie, whom the FBI had by now recruited as an informant. It was a beautiful sunny Wednesday morning on the eve of Halloween 2007 when Beloncito hopped aboard the Metro bus at Palu Avenue 
on his way to his job as a carpet installer with the company in Daly City. He was dressed in all black with Carhartt carpenter pants and a sweatshirt covering his tattoos, wearing nothing blue to signal his MS-13 affiliation. Beloncito moved down the aisle. Beloncito moved down the aisle of the bus, walking past some giggling elementary school kids and a sleeping homeless man. He took a seat in the last row. There were good reasons that Beloncito was widely considered the most vicious hitman for the San Francisco-based clique of La Mara Salvatrucha. Like Kid Twist, a New York mobster in the 1940s who was widely considered the most ruthless killer working at the time for the Murder, Inc., the Italian Mafia's enforcement unit, Belencito also had a penchant for the lethal use of common household tools. Kid Twist's weapon of choice was the ice pick, which he would ram through his victim's ear straight and deep into the brain. He became so adept at using an ice pick that many of his murder victims were thought by examining coroners to have died of natural cerebral hemorrhages. Belencito rode the bus through San Francisco's bustling rush hour streets, stopping at a crowded corner to pick up a group of waiting commuters. Trailing behind a group of school kids and day laborers boarding the bus, he spotted a Norteño homeboy sporting his colors, a red t-shirt and a red ball cap with a red bandana hanging out of his back pocket. He sat in the fifth row on the left, and Belencito began to size him up. The MS-13 homie's blood began to boil with fury and hatred for the rival gang member who was publicly flying his colors. Belencito couldn't take it any longer and decided he would walk the last few blocks to work. As the bus pulled over for the next stop, he stood and moved forward swiftly up the aisle. His senses were buzzing. Sweat began to form on his brow as he approached the chavala from behind, sliding the tool from his inside pocket and gripping it tightly. As the school kids completed homework answers in their workbooks, Belencito grabbed the collar of his victim and began thrusting the ice pick maniacally into his face and head. Over and over, he stabbed him 15 times. Blood squirted onto his victim's sweatshirt and all over the woman sitting in the next seat who was overcome and frozen with shock as the Chavala's head fell forward, slumping against the back of the next seat forward. Beloncito moved quickly to the front of the bus and exited before the door closed. He could hear screams as the vehicle started to drive away, then abruptly came to a screeching halt. He dumped the blood-covered ice pick into an alley trash can and walked the back streets to work. It was going to be a great Halloween. The big homies had something major planned in Central America. Maybe it was a riot, a prison break, or the murder of a prison official. Casper sold 